Hey guys, time for video number five, our final installment of Ecology Bliss in the video format. Uh, and what's nice about this video you'll find is that it's going to be a little bit shorter than most and uh, it's going to attempt to tie basically every single thing that we've talked about so far in ecology. This video uh, ties it all together and we want to look at um, focusing on this idea of cycles and look at nutrients in an ecosystem. Now the term nutrients being uh, really pertaining loosely to anything that is um, an abiotic factor, usually that organisms within an ecosystem need or that even other abiotic factors in an ecosystem need uh, to thrive. So we really want to look at essentially three main ideas here. So this concept of nutrient cycles, one big aspect is the idea of cycling. Think about the uh, anytime you hear the term cycle, uh, your mind should just literally be thinking um, you know, a, a round cycle that we could start right here and a series of events will progress but eventually uh, whatever is going on within this cycle will end up back where we started and the process will continue over and over again um, and that's really what we want to look at here uh, so the nerdy definition again there's that nerdy phrase uh, the movement and exchange of organic and inorganic matter back into production of living matter. Now wait a minute, what does that even mean? Um, one, probably the most important aspect is the exchange uh, of matter. Uh, you remember from physics, chemistry, physical science that matter can be neither created nor destroyed. It only changes its form. Uh, and that's really what we're after here, that organisms can take things in, pass things, quote unquote, along, and that will actually uh, provide sustenance and nutrition to other organisms and too much of, of some things or too little of some things can uh, be a bad thing. Boy, I just used the word thing there a lot. That's a no-no. But um, let's let's start to look at this in a little bit more detail because again, this, this phrase here is a little bit nerdy. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and we'll start with probably the easiest of the three that we'll mention here. Uh, use it as because it's a very familiar example, the water cycle. Uh, the idea that water is, well, water, H2O as we know, uh, but the fact that this key nutrient is going to cycle around back and forth within our uh, ecosystem uh, via phase changes and locations. So we take our little old water, it's a key nutrient to life, all life needs it, uh, as we recall there. So. Uh, the emphasis here is that it's it's going to change its phase, what shape, what form it's in, uh, and its locations, but it's still chemically H2O. So if we look at this closely here, we'll see uh, there's actually kind of a heck of a lot going on here. So let's start with, uh, let's take our water and our lakes and our oceans over here. If we could track just a molecule or a series of molecules of water here, uh, all living things need water, and water affects the environment. So if we were to start with our first part of the cycle here, evaporation. This water is actually through uh, heating, changes from liquid to a gas and evaporates into the atmosphere. Uh, at which point once those particles as they get up into the air begin to cool and they begin to condense and now we're, we've formed obviously our, our clouds here. Clouds just, just condensed water uh, with trapping of dirt and other particles uh, within that. But as you know, those clouds can, can move around an ecosystem. Now, now these things are full of liquid water here. Uh, but when we get over to this point, that water, which by the way is still H2O, we then have precipitation. That water will fall back down to the planet, down, down to the surface, um, and it could be in liquid form here. It could be in a uh, the form of snow and sleet and ice over here, but essentially it's precipitating, falling back down into the environment. So we've traveled from a liquid form here to a gas slash into a liquid form here, back into a liquid form. Um, notice it's it's still water along the way. The entire process, we're still talking about H2O, but it's, it's moved around and it's changed its form. Now once the water is back down uh, into the terrestrial environment, into the land again, it can soak into the ground, into streams and lakes and, and rivers again. Uh, and one very, very big thing here, this groundwater flow, we can see the term water table, 
a lot of people miss the fact that there is water, essentially rivers really, flowing underground throughout ecosystems. And that allows a way for water eventually will end up back through discharge, both underground and in the river, back into our lakes and oceans. So we can really uh, think of this primarily uh, evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. Now, you may be thinking, well, big deal here, so what? I mean, I've drawn the question mark over trees. Um, obviously, think of it just from a plant, from our photosynthesis aspect. Uh, we know that plants need to take in CO2. We know they need to take in sunlight, but they also need water. Uh, now, now you can play the best part uh, with ecology. You can play the what-if game. What if, what if, what if? Uh, what if something were to happen, let's say, uh, there was a lot less evaporation due to cloud cover due to lower temperatures. That would reduce our evaporation, which would reduce our condensation, which in some other areas down the line in this cycle could reduce precipitation. So you see that all of them are linked together here. Uh, and again, it's water is water. We, we don't end up changing this chemically, but the water is turned back uh, from water to water, but in different phases. And remember that our domino effect, uh, if something were to happen to cause more precipitation, that's going to alter the cycle as well. Uh, so again, we're not changing anything. It's just cycling back and forth through an ecosystem. Uh, another big one here, uh, really there's three of them. This one you actually, through video two, you're already really familiar with. It also is a question in our food web activity, uh, carbon cycle. We know that carbon is the basis for all of our organic molecules. It makes up carbs. It uh, Obviously carbohydrates makes up lipids, makes up um, proteins amino acids as well. So carbon is a big one. Uh, and again, carbon is, as we can look at this pretty uh, cheesy example, uh, remember here we're dealing with carbon. Carbon is carbon is carbon. Whether we're talking about carbon in the form of CO2, we're talking about carbon in the form of sugars as well. No matter what, we still have carbon here. So what we can look at here is that carbon is essentially is passed around throughout the environment. Um, change in its forms, but eventually if we could follow again one carbon atom, we'd find that uh, it changes the forms it's locked into, but it gets passed around. So let's start up here in our atmosphere with CO2. Could be released uh, through the burning of fossil fuels. Notice it's also released from uh, uh, animals undergoing uh, cellular respiration. We cannot forget about that. Cellular respiration we learned in video two is a huge part breaking down sugars into uh, energy and CO2 released as a byproduct. So now it's up in the atmosphere. Don't forget, remember our decomposers, they also decompose matter and, and that'll give off CO2 as well. So we have these huge amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere, but look at where a large majority, uh, uh, hopefully a large majority of that CO2 goes uh, in the form of photosynthesis. Remember our uh, photosynthesizers or autotrophs take that CO2 in, they undergo photosynthesis, and they turn it into carbohydrates. So now it's actually that carbon has been converted and stored into glucose and, and various other um, carbohydrate molecules and can be stored in the plants, uh, it can be put into soils, uh, and now we've got a couple of options here. Eventually, like from our food webs, those uh, photosynthesizers can die, uh, can decompose and go back up in the atmosphere. Sometimes they can be converted over a very long period of time into fossil fuels, talking oil, coal, uh, gas even. All of those are, are key components to um, or excuse me, are fossil fuels, and again, based on carbon. So those can be extracted and can then be burned and a bang, CO2 back in the atmosphere again. Uh, what about the actual plants here, algae, grasses, vegetation? Remember, those can be consumed by our herbivores, uh, also our omnivores as well. Um, can eat them. They take the sugars in. They either store them in their bodies. Oh my gosh, there's cows again. I hate cows. Evil, evil cows and uh, they can be stored in their bodies. They also can break down that uh, through, again, cellular respiration and put CO2 back in the atmosphere. So again, all we're dealing with here is carbon changing into various forms, but again, it's a resource, it's a waste product, but also a resource for many individuals as well. 
Uh, so with that in mind, we want to look at our third, our final cycle. And this one is a really, really important one that we want to emphasize because uh, it's often overlooked, a nitrogen cycle. And this looks a little bit convoluted here, but uh, our main focus that we really have to worry about primarily is that this nitrogen, uh, it makes up a huge part of our atmosphere. But that nitrogen ends up being over here in the form of nitrates. Uh, through a series of, of steps, those nitrates can be taken up uh, by plants and other photosynthesizers, uh, phytoplankton, algae, blue-green algae, etc. Uh, and that acts as a fertilizer. That helps them grow big and strong. They produce a lot of chlorophyll, bright green. That's why people will put uh, nitrogen-based fertilizers, nitrates, on their lawns. Uh, and, okay, great, that's incorporated into the plant tissue, and awesome. Uh, but here we have a little grazer there also eating that. Uh, animals can take the nitrogen into themselves. And two real f uh, big, big forms of nitrogen getting back into the soil. Uh, when they die, they can decompose. And also a huge one is animal waste. Um, a lot of animal waste, or animal waste contains huge amounts. We're talking pee and poop here. Might as well write that down. It's always fun. Who doesn't like to write out the words pee and poop? Um, is, is heavily laden in nitrogen. That can then end up back in uh, lakes and rivers and streams into the ground where bacteria will take that up, c help convert that. Again, over here we can see dead organisms and uh, feces, feces being poop and pee, um, convert that back into nitrates in the soil, and boom, the cycle starts all over again. So we do need nitrogen. Nitrogen is very important, but there's a problem. We can, lightning can help fix that uh, from the atmosphere, bacteria can help fix that, but again, we play what if, what if, what if, what if, what if we actually end up having, through various reasons, uh, too much nitrogen in an ecosystem? Uh, what, what could happen? I mean, we're just cycling these around, Mathers, matter is neither created nor destroyed, but... And this idea, let's focus on plants here, taking up the nitrogen, um, forming uh, chlorophyll. And remember, they're producing, using this nitrogen for photosynthesis to produce food. So big concept in ecology, and for us in our Winnipeg field trip, the idea of primary productivity. And this is a fancy term for the rate at which organisms will create new biomass. So if a plant is photosynthesizing a lot, producing a great deal of plant tissue and carbohydrates, they're creating mass, which remember, that's food for herbivores. That's why we call them primary producers. And we can see a very, very important part here is that different ecosystems, estuaries, tropical rainforests, etc., swamps, marshes, have huge amount of productivity. Think about why compared to something like uh, the frozen Arctic tundra, the very, very open ocean, uh, extreme deserts have very low primary productivity. Think about this. You have a lot of green plants, a lot of photosynthesizers, primary producers, a lot of water. It's wet, it's warm, it's sunny. Here, not so much. So with that idea of primary productivity, this is a big one. You definitely should be having this written down on our note sheets. What about, what, what helps with primary productivity? Because in a lot of these, especially in aquatic ecosystems, if there's a single nutrient that's scarce, or conversely, that's, that's an overabundance, uh, like nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and even water in some cases, uh, what if we don't have enough of it, or what if there's a huge surge of that? So we want to end by looking at what if an ecosystem, let's say a lake or a river, uh, received a huge sudden input of this limiting nutrient, such as, let's use nitrogen. It seems great on the surface. Hey, we'd end up with this explosion of primary productivity, huge algae blooms, little photosynthetic organisms, uh, mass producing, so we have this carpet of green. Awesome, right? A lot of photosynthetic activity. We can end up with things like red tide when we have uh, funky colored organisms, but eventually there's a problem. Those microscopic organisms, um, the phytoplankton, eventually die, and they sink to the bottom and fill out the water column. Now when they rot, all the bacteria that breaks them down has to undergo cellular re respiration, and they break down those massive amounts of algae. Remember our equation, unfortunately, cellular respiration uses up oxygen. So eventually, oxygen levels in that aquatic environment plummet. They go down. And you run out of oxygen, you end up with these 
problems. Low oxygen, which affects other organisms. Now I don't have enough oxygen to breathe, etc. So there's our, a great example of our butterfly effect. What happens if? Uh, we'll be looking at this through some activities uh, that we'll try in, in a little bit in class.